Welcome to Capital Dateline Online. I'm with our guest, Jim Saunders, Executive Editor of the News Service of Florida. Jim, there's been a lot of activity at the Florida Supreme Court. Let's just do a little uh, lightning round kind of thing. Um, first up, uh, let's talk about slots at paramutuals. Yeah, last week the, the Florida Supreme Court heard, a, heard arguments in what's really a closely watched uh, issue in the in the gambling industry, and it's about whether um, slot machines can be uh, allowed at, at Gretna Racing, which is a very small paramutual out in Gadsden County near near Tallahassee. Here, it's a lot of attention. Though, it, it's it? a lot of attention, and and the it's a big money involved in this issue. Uh, the voters out in Gadsden County uh, approved a referendum uh, to allow slot machines at this at this paramutual. And uh, the state has argued that the only way slots can be allowed are, uh, is with the approval of the legislature. Uh, the First District Court of Appeal agreed with the state on that argument, which led to an appeal to the Supreme Court. But this is, there's a lot of money involved in this. Slot machines are very lucrative. Paramutuals uh, have been looking for all sorts of revenue over the past uh, you know, couple decades because horse racing and dog racing has really... Uh, the popularity of them and the amount of money they made off them has really drop, dropped. And so they've looked for alternatives. Uh, slot machines have only been illegal, only legal in Broward and Miami-Dade County, and that was because of a constitutional amendment that passed, uh, I believe it was 2004. But uh, now there's this issue about whether if local voters pass slots and agree to slots in a referendum, whether they should be allowed to have them in different counties. Um, this case is important in another way because there's five other counties that have ap approved referendums. Let me think if I can remember these. <laughs> Brevard, Lee, right. Palm Beach, Hamilton, and Washington counties in addition to Gadsden County. So this is not just about one paramute, small paramutual up here in North Florida. It can have ramifications for, for at least six counties and who knows what it could open the door for if the Supreme Court rules for the paramutual. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about something that's been churning and will be into the, certainly into the legislature next year, which is workers' comp laws. Well, this is, uh, a lot of the issues at the Supreme Court right now are still uh, up in the air. They, they've been argued, but they haven't been decided. But workers' comp the, the, is an extremely complicated issue. But the Supreme Court has issued two opinions in about the last six weeks that have struck down parts of the state's workers' comp law. Uh, the latest was a, a ruling last week that uh, involved a St. Petersburg firefighter who was injured on the job. And that ruling was uh, focused on one type of benefits that uh, ran out for this, this injured firefighter. And the Supreme Court said the law is unconstitutional because, you know, he was left with a cover without coverage, essentially for a, for an on-the-job injury. But the bigger issue has been a ruling in late April, in which the Supreme Court uh, tossed out uh, uh, as unconstitutional a limit on attorneys' fees in workers' comp cases. And this is uh, attorneys' fees are probably one of the most high-profile issues in workers' comp law, mm. and the business community argues that uh, holding down attorney's fees helps hold down uh, workers' comp insurance rates. Uh, after this ruling by the Supreme Court, uh, an, an organization that files insurance rate requests for, for insurers uh, has requested a 17% increase in workers' comp insurance rates. Now, this isn't decided at this point. Uh, the regulators, uh, Office of Insurance Regulation still has to decide, but, uh, I think people do think that there is going to be some rate increases attached to these Supreme Court rulings, and the business groups are putting a lot of pressure on the legislature to take up this issue, to try to resolve it, and to try to hold down uh, workers' comp insurance rates. Part of the tricky part of any debate on workers' comp insurance is that there are so many parties with, a, with an interest in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Trial lawyers, plaintiffs' lawyers, are going to fight back hard on anything that uh, deals with attorneys' fees. Uh, but there are other groups: doctors, hospitals, chiropractors, labor unions. So once you open up the workers' comp can of worms, if you will, uh, a lot of issues can get on the table. And I expect this to be a really big issue in the legislature. Uh, 
you know, I don't know if they're going to take it up before the election in a special session, but after that, I expect this to be a pretty pretty heated uh, heated issue in the legislature. Food fight. It is. Um, and also up is medical malpractice caps. Well, and this is another big <laughs> historical food fight, at least. Uh, the uh, legislature and, and then Governor Jeb Bush in 2003 passed uh, major uh, legislation dealing with medical malpractice. And one of those, the major parts of that bill uh, was to limit non-economic damages, uh, which are commonly pain and suffering damages, mm -hmm. that, that people can uh, be awarded in medical malpractice cases. In 2014, the Supreme Court ruled part of that unconstitutional in a case that involved a, a, a death of a woman who had given birth and then she, uh, uh, her family sued for medical malpractice, right. uh, a wrongful death case. So they ruled that these damage caps were unconstitutional in that case. Last week, they heard, the Supreme Court heard arguments uh, in another sort of iteration of that. Uh, it involves a case uh, where a woman had a, a, an injury. Uh, she did not die, but she's challenging the caps as well. In her case, uh, the caps would cost her about $2 million in punitive, uh, no, I'm sorry, non-economic damages, right. uh, not punitive, right. non-economic damages. And so she is challenging the law as unconstitutional. She won at an appeals court, uh, the 4th District Court of Appeals. This involves a case of a woman who went in for surgery for carpal tunnel syndrome and uh, wound up uh, having a perforated esophagus uh, because of the uh, anesthesia process. Ah. They, they put the tube in her mouth and down her throat, and she mm -hmm. wound up with a perforated uh, esophagus and all sorts of complications. Mm -hmm. So the Supreme Court's deciding whether this dam these damage uh, caps are unconstitutional in her case. And if they are, they're gonna, they'll are going they have wide-ranging uh, implications for other uh, people bringing medical malpractice suits. And I tend to think the legislature may be asked to deal with that again if, indeed, the Supreme Court rules it unconstitutional. Uh, I'm not sure that, uh, that it, uh, you know, whether the legislature will take it up, but, uh, but you know, it's, gonna, it's a very high-profile issue for certain uh, segments of the medical population, or, I'm sorry, medical population, but also the medical profession, right. also uh, plaintiff's attorneys, insurance companies, and hospitals.